Hi, everyone. Irit Izips here for CSM Practice. Thank you for joining me once again for another episode at the CSM Practice podcast, where we share best practices around how to get maximum value for your clients and maximum value for your company and increase net retention rate and maybe even new leads by working the most that you can with your customer base. And one of the things that we hardly ever talk about is how can we actually impact the top funnel by allowing ourselves to work closely with our customer base to create advocacy? Today, I have Effie Mansdorf, who is going to share how she took her organization through a journey to maximize advocacy from clients, how she created a win situation for her clients from that framework, and what did it do to their business and company overall. So Effie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Erie. Maybe like in 30 seconds or so, tell us a little bit about your organization. What type of clients do you typically work with? Is it large enterprise accounts or a lot of smaller customers? So our goal is to mid to large enterprise accounts. Because we are a startup, we do have a little nice chunk of those smaller accounts. Our organization is in the cybersecurity field, which is a challenge in general when it comes to advocacy. It's very secretive. Organizations don't like to publicly announce what kind of tools they're using because they don't want the bad guys to know, uh, which is a little bit challenging, but it's a challenge we are able to overcome and I'm happy to talk about today. Just so that we get a sense for the organization, how many CSMs are we talking about and do you have any specialized roles in your team? We have CSMs based on region. So there's two in the US region, one in the EMEA region. And under me, I also have technical support as well, which we also have two. Two technical supports and about three CSMs? Yeah. CSMs and the tech support are all reporting to you, of course. Yes. You work mainly with what we call a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, and usually it's very hard to get advocacy from those types of individuals and uh, teams. Before we get into how did you actually get all that done, maybe you can tell us a little bit about once you implemented this framework, what happened to the organization? Why did we even start to begin with? What problem were we solving? And the problem that we were facing is that we're a startup. We're a typical growth-led and very innovative startup. We've been around about three years. We're going on our fourth year now. And there were a few problems that we were trying to solve. One is we needed to get our peer-to-peer -peer advocacy up. We saw that we have very little competitors, but the competitor that we do have had a lot of more peer reviews than our organization had. And we saw that that lends a hand when it comes to closing deals, when it comes to also our branding and marketing out there. The other challenge is that we needed logos, we needed testimonials, we needed those kind of things, and that is very hard to get. And third, the internal advocacy, our product team needed some feedback and cooperation with some of our key customers in order to go ahead and innovate and to improve the current products that we had, and we needed that cooperation. So in order for us to close more deals, to expand and to be innovative, we needed all of our customers to cooperate. And who is the gatekeeper to all of our customers and selecting those customers and getting them through? It's the customer success team. So that was the problem that we were trying to solve essentially. Clearly, we're gonna look at how did you implement it, an advocacy framework, but at the top level and like very few words, what are the few things that you ended up implementing within your organization in terms of advocacy? So we got those peer-to-peer -peer reviews up. We managed to increase that in a very short time span, up to 400%. And that in particular was Gartner peer reviews. We were able to also get sales reference and advocacy, meaning use cases as well. And we were able to get design partners for our product team on a much larger scale. When you think about these three, four things that you have done as part of this framework, those are the results. 
What was the impact on the business after you've implemented them? From the product point of view, we were able to innovate a lot faster and the quality of what we have was also a lot better because we had those design partners and the instant feedback and those customers that are design partners, they're very excited to work with us. So we know that a lot of what we're doing is not only based on theory and market research, but actual feedback that we get from our real customers. So we were able to innovate a lot faster and the quality is much better. In terms of our sales references, we were able to close deals a lot faster because now we had a list of exactly what kind of sales reference, what the vertical is, what size company, and we're able to match up much faster without actually walking in the dark. And we know exactly how to match those up. And then third, when we have those reviews, we're able to not only bump our branding, but we're also able to start taking testimonials and creating use cases out of that, which we didn't have before. So you created new peer reports, use cases, increase the speed in which sales cycles are being closed and you also impacted the product roadmap. These aren't things that are direct KPIs of our customer success team. Getting those advocacies are. And again, if it wasn't for the know-how and the relationships and the knowledge of our CSMs with our customers, we wouldn't have been able to get all of that done. Do you think if you didn't implement the strategy, what would have happened to the organization? We would have had a much harder time in, first of all, building brand advocates because best salespeople are our customers. If our customers can be brand advocates, that's all we need. And those peer reviews, even working as design partners, that already is creating brand advocates. And if we didn't have that, we would have been in a lot harder moving forward. And of course, the competitive advantage that we have, we have a lot more case studies, we have a lot more peer reports and a lot more innovative as opposed to our competitors. And that is because of these programs that were implemented. And of course, you have the customer referrals and qualified leads for marketing. That goes without saying that that also is something that we may not have had, had this program not been implemented. At the essence of it, your charter was to create an advocacy framework for your company, given the challenge that you're going to be working with teams that usually don't give reviews, that don't go out on a limb to tell about their business anything because they're in the security space. And I think a lot of the folks that are listening to this video or this podcast, all of us have a little bit of that. Like when we work with a public company, we all have some cohort of customers where it's hard to get them to say yes around advocacy. In building the customer advocacy framework, how do you perceive advocacy? What does that mean to you? There's two types of advocacy, the internal advocacy and the external advocacy. The internal advocacy is how we could get customers to work with us and for us. And for that, they don't have to externally go out and reveal the secrets to their world. They don't have to publicly declare anything, but they do do that internally. And that's tremendously helpful from an organization point of view in order to be innovative and make sure you're releasing quality product. So the other one is the external advocacy. And that external advocacy is when they are sort of declaring to the world what works for us, why we love our company, why Adaptive Shield is so great. And there are many ways to do that and you don't have to do that publicly. So that's one of the strategies that we've implemented. Yeah, that's very cool because you're not just thinking about online reviews. You're thinking, huh, can I harness their power to actually champion for us also internally? Did I get that right? Absolutely. Champion internally is exactly what I was referring to. Why for you advocacy was so important to tackle? You talked about some of the challenges you had. Why did you pick that as an initiative right off the gate? One of the reasons that I chose that as an initiative is because of two reasons. One, the point in time that Adaptive Shield is at. Adaptive Shield is a startup and we're very, very innovative. And we can't move forward without the cooperation with our customers, as opposed to a large corporate entity that's been around for 30 years, may not be so dependent and also sort of an old school way of we could independently move forward and do what we need without the cooperation of our customers. We were not like that. The second thing is, is that I can draw a direct line with the quality of the CSM's work 
and the amount of advocacy they can produce with their customers. That's a KPI that you need customer success for. For advocacy, when a CSM can produce a lot of advocates any which way from their customer base, that shows to me that they're doing a good job. One of the things that you changed is their comp plan. Like, did you tie the variable or at least the team performance annual reviews or quarterly reviews to that KPI? While they don't get comped on it, it is a KPI that we do regularly review and they do have goals and metrics that they have to get to for those. So do you give quarterly goals? Quarterly goals and half year goals for certain of those KPIs. So for example, case studies is a little bit harder to get and takes long term. So those will be half year goals. But quarterly goals, we could get sales references and reviews. Those are a little bit more attainable and could get them on a quarterly review. So how did you do it? Obviously a great feat, lots of impact, important initiative. What's your secret sauce? How did you do it? KPIs is a great incentive for teams. If they know they're measured on it, they know that it's a priority. Knowing exactly how to approach the customers. So for the different goals that we've had, whether it's getting design partners or peer reports or whatever else it is, we basically built a strategy in order to know how to approach, when to approach, and when not to approach, which is extremely important. When we sort of are able to put that into our customer journey and know exactly which points in order to approach and how to approach, then the outcome is much more successful. Here you are, you're thinking, okay, let's double down on advocacy. You tweak the performance review and you give your team specific goals. How do you hold them accountable? Where do you track use cases, testimonials? And then how do you empower them to actually ask a client? Did you give them some guidelines as to when to ask? Did you framework specific use cases or specific product or service that they should be targeting? Maybe you can share a little bit about the framework. For any sort of reviews or referrals, like I said, the best time to approach our customers is in the renewal time when they're on board, they're spending more money or the same amount of money. So that's a great opportunity as well. Another time to do it is when we do these executive business reviews. There's always great feedback when it comes to that. And that's a great way to keep a momentum in order to ask, hey, I see that you that there's some sort of gap that you would like to see in our product. Would you like to be a design partner? or that's great feedback, are you willing to go ahead and do a Gartner peer review? And by the way, when it comes to Gartner peer reviews or other similar ones, they're completely anonymous. So any customer who is a little hesitant, I don't know, my boss, legal has to go through, and that's not something that is exclusive to cybersecurity, it's an everywhere. Gartner peer reviews are a great way to get customer feedback in an anonymous way. Other ways that we know is on onboarding. Onboarding is the best discovery time that you could have with a customer. So when you have that discovery time, you need to know what their use cases are. If there's some sort of interesting or targeted use case that we know that they'll have, that's a great way to also sort of track it along the way and have a goal for the CSM to know this is their use case. I'm going to nurture it and make sure they get all their value so we can get a use case out of it at the end. Now that you implemented this framework and the strategy, the salespeople can quickly see who could be an advocate and they could kind of like slice and dice and query the data to find the right one. It almost sounded to me like you either put all these potential advocates in an Excel sheet or a database. Can you share a little bit about what you've done there? With us particular, we use Salesforce. We have Monday boards for absolutely anything. We have the Advocacy Monday board. So two things we do for the salespeople, if they need to go ahead and look for a specific vertical, a specific type, or any sort of reference, they could go ahead and look at the Monday board. Same thing for our marketing team. The minute that we identify an opportunity, we could go ahead and update our Monday board with the proper information. We have rules and alerts and notifications set. So all that could be quick and seamless. You have a list, but how do you know which customer makes a good advocate? Because I've seen customers where you put them on a reference call and then they're so truthful or they sell clients like the wrong product or service. Did that ever happen to you? Or like, how do you mitigate for that risk? Absolutely. So we were finding that sometimes when it comes to reviews or case studies, the customers weren't being guided or were saying things that maybe we didn't want them to go to certain places. So another approach that we've had is, for example, instead of just saying, hey, can you be a reference or, hey, can you do this peer review for us? 
be very specific in what we're looking for. So instead of just saying, hey, we want you to do a reference, say, remember when we solved this particular case for you or when we were able to troubleshoot some technical thing for you and it helped you in XYZ way, we would appreciate if you mentioned that. So guiding the customer in a certain way when it comes to advocating is extremely helpful and it ensures that they're cooperative and everyone gets what they want at the end. Do you ever get a customer in the advocacy database, but... So the salespeople reached out to them, but they were actually sort of like in red or they were not like in the right moment to be approached? Not yet. And the reason for that is for the advocacy, we have a couple of stages. So the first stage, if a CSM finds a good advocate, they'll put all the information in this Monday board. The second thing is it has to have CSM approval, meaning I have to go over it and make sure, you know what, this is the right time. There's nothing commercially going on. There's nothing else that's going on. I also like to avoid that typical customer, that's the go-to customer. Everyone has that, that customer friend of yours that we keep on asking and asking and asking, and there's too many asks. That's the first level of review that has to go. Once I review it, it could go down to the next stage. So that avoids any sort of, they're in a renewal stage or commercially not ready. There's some sort of issue or ticket that's open just to make sure that this is the right time and the right situation for them to advocate. The next stage is marketing has to approve. They have to know that this is a type of customer that we want. Maybe they're too small, maybe they're too big, maybe it's not the right vertical. The worst thing we want to do is to get a customer excited that they're going to participate in some sort of program with us just to be disappointed and find out that marketing is like, nah, pass. That's very embarrassing and we don't want that to happen. So marketing has to approve it as well. Once marketing approves it, I approve it, then we could go ahead and approach the customer and ask what we need from them. Amazing. Do you manage this approval process somewhere? Is it also in Monday? Also in Monday. All these alerts, notifications. All the boards get automatically updated. If I'm in sales or even maybe like somebody that needs like organizing an event and I'm looking for a speaker, I will submit a request on monday.com. It will pass by the CSM, yourself and the marketing for approval. And only then can they approach the specific contact. Is that correct? Yes. So that would be the proactive approach. And the other approach would be the reactive approach. A CSM already identifies some sort of good opportunity and we'll start moving the wheels and make sure that everybody internally approves before we actually approach them as well. How do you move the wheels? Like, are there specific, like a checklist that you go through? Is that also submitted through monday.com or do you have like a Slack channel? So there is a Slack channel. And again, all every internal approver has that list of knowing what they're looking for in order to go ahead and approve it. So for me, again, like in particular, I could cross-reference this with the Monday board and Salesforce to see how many advocacy activities have they done in the past six months? Where are they commercially? Are they at risk? Are there any escalation issues? And so on and so forth. And marketing has their own versions as well. You have three CSMs. Some teams have a hundred CSMs and some of them are like first time CSMs. If I'm a first time CSM and you tell me and hey, go find some advocates, I need some guidelines. Like what does a good candidate for an advocate looks like? What am I looking for? Basically, you're looking for a fan. You're not just looking for someone who likes your product or service or has adopting your product or service. Someone who would go out and yell from the highest mountain that they love your service. And you know that they'd be good in order to either talk or advocate for you. It also has to do a personality thing. If you could identify a good sort of personality, someone who likes talking, likes sharing, likes cooperating, that's the person for you. If you know you have a champion who's a little quiet, loves your product, works well, that may not be the person for you. Also listen out for any of those, hey, you know, this was helpful or we've got value or benefit from. Ask those leading questions of what's working. The best things you could do is anytime you get some positive feedback from a customer say this worked for us is always follow up with why. Once you get that why going, it's like a waterfall. You're going to get all this great little nuggets that you could use. Is there anything else you encourage them to look at to just identify who might be a potential? Other things that you could do at is also look outside and see, hey, 
are they opening tickets? What kind of things are they opening for? The kind of tickets that they open can actually reflect what they're working on at the moment. If they're working on some interesting use case, if they're working on a certain area within your product that you want to focus on, look obviously at the customer pulse. Is it in red or is it in green? You know that they're going to be obviously stay away from those who even recently changed a pulse. Veterans are a great customer advocate. Just the fact that they've been with organization, they, they've been a customer three, four, five, whatever years, that in itself shows that they could be a good advocate. Are they using any specialized features that perhaps in other areas that other customers are not? That is a great area to focus on because you know that they have a specific use case that could maybe benefit others. And of course, are they engaged with the CSM? Requesting new features, anyone that loves your product and is asking for more is a great advocate. So you have identified the right customers. And then what are the type of things that you typically ask them to do? Are there like some things that you wouldn't ask them to do like the first time they get involved as an advocate or anything just depends on the customer? First of all, I would say start small. Many organizations these days are recording calls, for example. So just from those day-to-day -day calls that a CSM may have, you may find good feedback just from those chorus or gong or whatever call recording <laughs> vendor is. So those are something that you could use right away just internally. We have a Slack channel at Adaptive Shield. So when we're talking about internal advocacy that all our product and marketing and salespeople are on. So anytime a CSM or anyone else, even someone from a technical support has some good feedback, we go ahead, we take that little snippet and we post it on our Slack channel for all to see. And then you could start moving forward with any sort of peer reviews that are anonymous. Again, you don't have to go through legal. It doesn't have to be a big deal. Social media and posts as well. Encourage your customers to advocate for you and advocate for themselves. If they've been successful in some sort of way, they could go ahead and upload a post in social media and talk about themselves while also advocating for your organization. You know what? I've never asked a client to advocate on social media. What does the CSM say? What's the problem? So basically, so there's a lot of mutual posts that you could go ahead and do. So a lot of times your marketing may have sort of like a customer, and that's not something that we use a lot here at Adaptive Shield, but I've used it in other organization, a customer spotlight. And once the customer spotlight is happening, they could go ahead and post themselves that look very proud to be on the customer spotlight for this and that that I've done. So that works well. And of course, case studies, specific industry study that we had together. In this case, it was with Forrester. And they were able to say that they participated in this well-known study, which is great for their career. It's great for us. And everyone wins. You're making a good point. There's a lot of things that actually when a customer does participate in these advocacy, that they get something in it for themselves, either for the company, showcasing how they double down on investment in a certain area to get their clients comfortable, whether it's customer success or security or learning management program or training. But it's also good from a personal standpoint for the key stakeholder to showcase their wins and their investments and their career development. So I absolutely agree with that. And thanks for highlighting. You mentioned that sometimes you invite those stakeholders to participate in events as well. And you consider that as part of advocacy. What type of events do you typically give them platform to showcase their expertise and their experience with you? At the end of the day, advocacy is what's in it for them. So if we could get them to speak in an event or other sort of thing, it's a great win. So the type of things that we focus on are either internal user groups. Sometimes what you could do is invite a certain amount of customers in order to talk about what was helpful for them. And it's in a closed user group. And then they could go ahead and share. So you could highlight something that worked for them. And it's in a closed environment and it's not sort of public. The more public will be speaking engagements and industry conferences and that sort of thing. Co-speak and co-sponsor of how some sort of product that you did helped an organization. And of course, sort of like what we're doing, but in a very specific webinar or podcast that is sponsored by your company, customers would start to scramble and would want to participate in a lot of those things as well. You mentioned earlier that some of the things that you were looking to get out of the advocacy program is sales references and you build a database in monday.com. I wonder if you can kind of walk us through how did you coach your team to create referenceable database? I mean, 
Do you offer like a referral incentive? So the first thing that they need to do is ask who they're asking for a reference. Usually day-to-day end users tend to be the ones that a lot of CSMs speak to the most or have a lot of contact. They're not the typical referenceable a user when it comes to a sales cycle. They want someone a little bit higher up, either a budget owner, some sort of decision maker. So a lot of CSMs tend to ask the wrong persona. So that's the first thing is look at the right persona when you're asking. And the second thing is, of course, make sure that it's the, they do have something correct to say or they do have something valuable to say. And sometimes we will guide our CSMs to specific customers themselves. We need more references in this sort of segment or this sort of vertical. And that will be a lot more proactive and seeing who can we approach at this point. Well, I'm kind of curious, Effie, because like for me, when I ask reference from a client, I just email them, hey, would you give me a warm recommendation? Hopefully they say yes. And then I just connect them real quick and hope everything would work. You saying, no, 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 put the brakes on. Do you recommend, for example, that the CSM would call the executive first or the salesperson or you like call and coach them? Here's the situation. Here's what this client is looking for and kind of gives them a little bit more background so that they can focus on the right things. Absolutely. I make sure that no one on my team ever asks for any of these requests by email. It should be done in person, either on a call, on a Zoom, on some sort of meeting. Asking to be a reference for a big decision maker on email is a little bit tactless, unprofessional. I just feel you're going to get a better quality, especially when if we're talking about sales references and we're talking about big industry enterprise, this has to be done in person. And I know better. Because actually when I build it for others, I do tell them to call. And even when I worked like 10 years ago in a software company, I would call. And then somehow when you own your own business, you kind of get lazy. Oh, I know them so well that they should be fine. And it's like, So sometimes there are exceptions if you have a good relationship with them and you know that it's fine that you could go ahead and send that email. You make a good point because like if I was interviewing for a company for a job, I would never ask somebody, hey, can you give me a reference via text? I remember myself being younger and actually interviewing for jobs. And I would actually call the person and say, here's the job. Here's who you're going to talk to. I would actually coach them just to make sure that the reference is done well. I would give them as much background. And I think that there's something to be said, you know, when you do a sales reference, especially if the deal is larger, sort of want to have some coaching for the referee. I mean, they are investing their time because they do want to help you. Otherwise, they wouldn't have taken that call. Yeah, I see no difference in a job reference and a sales reference. It's the exact same thing. This is what they're going to ask you. This is what they're expecting. We would appreciate if you highlight this, that, and the other. And thank you so much for being a reference, of course. Do you ever think about advocacy in a one-to-many structure like a community or a cab or anything like that? And if so, what have you done in that respect? Absolutely. Cabs are great and community is great. So in order to do a cab or community, you have to make sure that you have a good customer bulk and a good representation of your customers and a varying degree. So for community events, community boards, you want to have some sort of common denominator so that when they are advocating and they are discussing your product or service, there is something common there so everyone can relate and benefit from that. For the cab, it's actually, I would say the opposite. You want to have a very varied look at the type of customers that you're having because that could really help push your organization forward. Of course, there's always Slack groups, community boards, and even surveys. Surveys is a great one to many. I'm not a huge fan of NPS and CSATs as an end all or be all, but they are great tools to get some feedback. So while you are getting some sort of score, finish that off with, can you tell us a little bit more about why you gave us that score? Can we contact you to discuss it further? Bad or good, by the way, not just the good stuff. Do you have a, like a call to action when one of the respondents actually give you a promoter score? Besides that question that's embedded in the survey, do you also reach out to double click to see if they might be a good advocate for one of the advocacy channels that you offer? Absolutely. These are different ways that you could go ahead and look at it. Once you are done with a survey, and again, for bad or good, 
you could go ahead and hopefully they did click to expand and they did give a little bit more information. Then you could start going and seeing like, who was it? Where are they in the customer journey? Is this a great person or organization to reach out and nurture? Now that you have all that in place, you mentioned that you're using monday.com as your board. So this is the dashboard that you have and this is in monday.com? Mm -hmm. These are examples of some of the things that we could do. So for example, the case studies, as you could see, we're focused on our strategic segment, locals and testimonial. We also want strategic or enterprise and then sales reference strategic enterprise or commercial. So we sort of segment them so we know exactly what we're doing, but this is the board and we have different statuses, as you can see from the colors there as well, various staging of approvals, various stages of tracking throughout. By the way, how long did it take you to get to the maturity level you have it within your own organization today? It took about a half a year in order to get it to a point that well-oiled mechanism because it does take time to find the customers that are in the right stage. It takes time for the CSMs to get used to proactively approaching. Today, we're in a really good place. So that includes the monday.com, the process of approval and getting yeah. sales being used to actually asking you guys before they actually call anybody? Yeah. I mean, I have to get the other teams to adopt to this too. I have to get sales and marketing and product to adopt to this new process and make sure that they're using it and following processes, just like any other customer that we may do. It's a process like any other. Absolutely. Okay. Looking back, what are the kind of like key challenges you had to overcome? And do you have any tips for those who are about to embark on this and want to have that in their organization? First thing I would say that, especially when we're talking about approaching your customer is make sure you're doing it in the right time. When you have other sales or product, or you don't have a process yet, make sure that at least you could start off with verifying with CS before approaching customers. That I'd say, even if you don't have a process in place, that could be the basic process that you could do. Of course, track everything and align these targets with the other team members. If my team member has a target of sales references, but sales doesn't care about it, then there's some sort of misalignment. If my team has a target of getting case studies, but there's no case studies to be had with marketing, that's another misalignment. So when you do build this program, make sure that you're doing it within the KPIs of product and marketing and sales and whoever else. Anything they shouldn't do? So what you shouldn't do is put all the burden on the customer. So if you are asking for a case study, if you are asking for some sort of sales reference, don't just give it to them and have them do all the hard work. You do all the heavy lifting. So if it's a case study or some sort of review, you could say, this is what we're looking for. Can you review it? Add whatever you need to review and approve it. Also plan early. Don't start scrambling at the end especially if you have any metrics or KPI and say, oh my gosh, I need an, another five advocates and six Gartner reviews. I don't have it. Start planning early. You could identify already from the onboarding stage or any other stage, this is going to be a good advocate and you'll know exactly how to nurture them. Effie, you're so wonderful. I think a lot of people that are going to watch this episode are going to be just fantastically inspired in doing more around advocacy from the customer success function and implement a lot of these elements, including a monday.com board and a process of approval. All of these are great tactics. I want to thank you for hopefully inspiring a lot more professionals to get more value for their business and also position the what's in it for the client better. Thank you so much for having me. And it was great talking to you as well. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this interview. Big love from me and everybody. If you liked this episode, give it a like, subscribe to our podcast, and I'll see you at the next one.